Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Hello and welcome to you all the last day of the week and so far as the Andrew Lawton show is concerned anyway you've made it through welcome it was a bit of an abbreviated week for us but we are here it is Thursday January 4th 2023 no I said okay I said yesterday I was going to do this it is 2024 uh, January 4th, 2024. We haven't just uh, transported back in time uh, 365 days. No, I, well, I don't think so anyway. I mean, who knows? This is all a simulation, you might even say. It is good to have you aboard the program. If you were uh, following along, I had a few emails asking about this, which I, I'm very grateful that you take such in, an interest in my otherwise boring life. Uh, just before the uh, holiday break, uh, the Christmas break, I, you may recall, did a, a sit-down interview with Pierre Polyev, the leader of the Conservatives. We uh, did the interview in Mississauga, Ontario. I live in southwestern Ontario. And I told you, I think it was the day after or whatever, on the way back from that interview, I got into a four-car accident on the 401, which is on Ontario's major parking lot, or highway rather. And the uh, 401, it was a four-car accident. No injuries, thankfully. Uh, we were all able to drive our cars back. But I, I, my car, the insurance company was thinking is probably totaled. And I, I still, it's like weeks later, and they only just told me this morning, yes, your car is totaled, but they haven't yet given me the magic number of how much they're uh, going to give me for my car. So I am, uh, uh, to those who asked, I am still automobilist. If you have any car recommendations, I guess send them along. I, I'm going to get like a, anytime you ask people to recommend something, you get like uh, a million contradictory emails of, you know, always get this, never do this, never do this. But if you have a good recommendation, I guess I will, uh, will have to take it there. Uh, right now, thankfully, I am uh, doing my best to not leave home. Uh, because when I say I don't have a car, I mean it. I'm not doing like this weird Christian Freeland loophole where uh, she says she doesn't have a car but manages to put on more miles than most uh, Canadian truckers do. Uh, you may have seen this story that came out this week. Christian Freeland uh, has been racking up thousands and thousands of dollars in limo expenses in the greater Toronto area. Now, why this is important. If you're a cabinet minister, if certainly a deputy prime minister, you uh, cannot be expected to drive around like some pleb. So cabinet ministers, conservative, liberal, doesn't matter. They get access to a car and driver. Now, I'm not taking issue with that because to be honest, if you've got work to do and you're on the phone, whatever, that's fine. I do take issue with it when Christopher Freeland makes this big whole stink about how uh, she's doing what she can for the climate. She is going without a car and her whole line which you may recall, well, let's just play the clip. What is it she said exactly? I right now am an MP for downtown Toronto. Um, a fact that still shocks my dad is I don't actually own a car because I live in downtown Toronto. I'm like, I don't know, 300 meters from the nearest subway. Um, I walk, I take the subway, I make my kids walk and ride their bikes and take the subway. It's actually healthier for our family. I can live that way. But you don't live that way. You choose not to live that way. Uh, when I see in the uh, Toronto Sun, which built off of reporting from Black Locks Reporter, uh, Christopher Freeland uh, spent $3,040 in Toronto for limo and taxi rides, plus uh, $6,736 in separate trips for her official chauffeur. So uh, like all middle-class Canadians, she's got like the main chauffeur and then the auxiliary chauffeur for and then like when she really has to slum it she just takes a taxi so she's got like the the three tiers of uh limo service and taxi service she gets uh again the issue here is that she's like oh i just take the subway well no you don't maybe she's taking her limo to the subway station maybe that 300 meters gets uh really really tough in the winter months uh, being in canada but even her living in downtown toronto when she's like oh well yeah we can live without cars uh you're not you're choosing not to so uh maybe Maybe you lay off the judgment of families who have to make choices to get around when you yourself are making those same choices, except sending the taxpayer a rather steep bill for it. And as I've said in the past, one thing about Christian Freeland here, which is incredibly noteworthy and hasn't ever really been reported, and, and you may say, well, it's no big deal. 
She does not, uh, based on all that I've been able to figure out, have uh, an apartment or condo in Ottawa, which is what most MPs do. Uh, she commutes back and forth. And when she stays in Ottawa, she stays in a hotel. Now, uh, you're allowed to do that. You have a, a budget. And if you want to use your budget as an MP on an apartment or you want to use it on a hotel and uh, rack up the Marriott points, you have that option. But Christian Freeland goes back and forth multiple times during the week. I saw her at the airport on one such run. She was waiting for a, a Porter flight. And when she saw me at the airport, she put on her sunglasses and turned away, which is about the best endorsement of my work I can think of. And uh, this is, I think, the fascinating thing here is that uh, she herself is not doing what she's demanding other Canadians do. So uh, maybe we can just lay off the climate judgment that we seem to get from this government. I uh, wanted to talk for a few moments here about Leslin Lewis, who is the Conservative Member of Parliament in Haldeman, Norfolk. She is a two-time leadership candidate, and she has come under the media's and the Liberals' fire in the last couple of days for a petition she has sponsored, uh, which is calling on Canada to withdraw from the United Nations and uh, related organizations like the World Health Organization and the like. Now, this is a petition that was first put forward in October, but I think after that one petition that we spoke about in December, calling for a recall of Trudeau, which got like, I think it was nearly 400,000 when all is said and done, now, like, petitions are all the rage. So, uh, Lesson Lewis has been pumping the tires on this petition, saying that uh, 66,000 Canadians so far have signed it, and because she's been reviving the attention on it, it's attracted some renewed uh, scrutiny, I will say, from the Globe and Mail, and as such, from a bunch of Liberal members of Parliament. And I, I, I want to just read from the petition here, because the petition makes a, a sensible enough point. It says, Canada's membership in the United Nations and its subsidiary organizations imposes negative consequences on the people of Canada, far outweighing any benefits. It talks about sustainable development goals, Agenda 2030. And it goes on to say that uh, this body and Canada's membership in it has essentially given outsized influence and power over Canada by groups like the UN, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, Planned Parenthood, Bill and Melinda Gates. It doesn't show its work on this, but it says that Canada should have an urgently implemented expeditious withdrawal from the UN and all its subsidiary organizations. That's the petition. Now, uh, this is a petition that any Canadian can put forward. You've heard me say time and time again on this show that these things are not by they don't really do anything except for give a bit of momentum around an issue. Again, 66,000 signatures is not nothing, but it, it's not huge in the grand scheme of things in a country with pushing 40 million people. But the fact that Lesla Lewis was promoting this, people do not like. I'll give you a few examples of this here. I, I did the, the horrendous task of uh, going over liberal members of Parliament's Twitter accounts. I, I had to take a shower right before the show, almost missed the show. But uh, Seamus O'Regan, who's a, a former cabinet minister, had this to say. Withdraw trade from Ukraine, or withdraw trade with Ukraine, withdraw military aid to Ukraine, and now withdraw from the United Nations. Seriously, what is up? with the Conservative Party. Uh, Cody Blaze, who is a member of parliament in King's Hance out on the East Coast, said, I need to wait until it's up on the screen before I can read it. I don't have it in my, my document in front of me here. Uh, says, good idea, Lesson. Let's take Canada out of the international forum with 193 countries around the world. This stuff is bat bleep crazy. Uh, Cody didn't give the bleep there. That was just uh, from yours truly. And I don't know what is more ridiculous, the fact that she is peddling this stuff or that she sits in the conservative shadow cabinet. And uh, let's see, what else do we have here? We will read uh, Charlie Angus. I mean, I, I never want to make the mistake of thinking Charlie Angus is relevant, but uh, Charlie Angus, who is with the NDP, says two weeks ago, Polyev ordered his MPs to vote against support for Ukraine. Now one of his front bench MPs is leading the fight to pull Canada out of the UN. The conservatives are not playing to the conspiracy base. They are the conspiracy base. Dun, dun, dun. And of course, the Liberal Party itself weighs in, never wanting to let one of these little uh, mini stories go to waste. The official line from the Liberals here uh, references the far left rag press progress calling far right conspiracy groups 
and they say Polyev needs to denounce this reckless idea immediately. Now, there are, I mean, even people on the left have a lot of criticisms for the United Nations. This is a, an organization that elevates uh, dictatorial regimes like Iran and Saudi Arabia and North Korea. Uh, it puts uh, countries that don't have women's rights on the women's rights committees. It puts countries that don't respect free speech on the human rights committees. It puts countries that don't even ensure the basic necessaries of life for their citizens on all of these committees where they then pass resolutions that lecture everyone else for not doing more. So the United Nations is not and should not be above scrutiny here. And now, uh, whether the answer to that is to work within it or just withdraw altogether, uh, people can decide for themselves. Let's be real, it's never going to happen. There, there's not going to be without some larger current that exists in the world right now that, let's be real, is probably going to involve the U.S. Uh, there isn't going to be a, a connexit, if you will, from the United Nations or... I, the WHO is a bit different. I actually could see... Uh, Canada conceivably withdrawing or pulling back from the WHO. But we're not sitting out at the UN. And you may think we should, uh, but we won't. So, But the idea that it's just such a, a terrible thing to do, that you shouldn't be allowed to criticize the UN, you shouldn't be allowed to have this discussion, that's really what the Liberals are doing here. The Liberals are saying that this is the kind of thing that is above scrutiny. It's above reproach. You're not allowed to talk about it. No discussion whatsoever. And if you do... If you dare to talk about it, you are just an evil, dirty, scary conspiracy theorist. That is the point that they're making here. And you know, look, I just saw a few moments before I, I went on air a press release from the Liberals. They're announcing their candidate for Durham. So this is a riding in the GTA. Jamil Giovanni is the conservative candidate, it's replacing Aaron O'Toole. Uh, they haven't called a date for the by-election yet, but the Liberals now have their candidate. And the, I was skimming through it, and there's a line here. I'll see if I can find it. Here we go. With Pierre Polyev and conservative politicians trying to import far-right American politics to Canada and pushing for deep cuts to public health care, $10 a day child care and dental care and support for the middle class, now more than ever, uh, Durham needs a community champion, yada, yada. I, I love the equivalence, by the way. Uh, the conservatives are A, challenging the $10 a day child care and be importing far right American politics. These are their, their great sins. Uh, they're challenging a liberal child care policy and they're uh, being uh, populist demagogues or whatever the, the liberals are accusing them of. But uh, this is what's happening here. And again, I think we should allow the discussion to criticize the UN and the WHO. Uh, and anyone who says after the last three years, that there are no criticisms you can make of the WHO clearly was not paying attention or is just uh, so far in the bag. They're like that uh, Tedros Adhanom guy at the WHO that just wants to, you know, suck up to Chairman Xi more than doing anything else. So uh, that is uh, straight out of the Politburo if you want to say that you're not allowed to have these discussions and make these criticisms. So I wanted to turn to the, uh, the left coast or the west coast, depending on how you refer to it, with all due respect to our friends and followers in British Columbia. But in BC, there was a, a rather dismal Supreme Court ruling, uh, the BC Supreme Court the other day, in which they effectively said that if you try to get drug users out of playgrounds where children are congregating, it's somehow a violation of the drug user's constitutional rights. This is not just a, a reasonable concession that you could make while letting people do their drugs everywhere else in BC, which is the province's policy. No, it's a violation of their constitutional rights. So uh, what more backwards and I, I will say authentic display of, of how British Columbia is viewing this than that ruling. And th this comes at a time where there was a, a rather unique report that came out from the McDonald Laurier Institute by National Post columnist Adam Zebo, who's been on the show before, looking at the effects of BC's so-called safe supply policy. And uh, if you followed this issue on this show or elsewhere in the past, you know that the word safe is a misnomer if ever there was one. But figured we'd delve into both of these issues. Adam Zebo returns here. Adam, good to talk to you. Thanks for coming back on. Good to, good to talk to you too. Thanks for having me back. So let's just start with the Supreme Court ruling I hear. This, this is a, a, a system in Canada, the legal system, that will say that any constitutional right, if you want free speech, if you want freedom of expression, all of that is subject to all of these caveats and exceptions and carve-outs and uh, balancing against other people's. And here we have an example where to say that we don't want drug users on playgrounds you can just go 50 meters away. It doesn't seem like that big a concession, but they're saying, oh, no, 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 drug users have rights. 
Well, so their argument essentially is that if you ban people from using drugs in public spaces, that will encourage them to use alone. And then if they use alone, they're more likely to die of an overdose. Therefore, uh, banning public drug consumption endangers drug users' lives uh, in a way that is just not acceptable. Uh, that's a very questionable argument. Uh, I think that there isn't really any strong evidence behind that argument, from my understanding. Uh, and I think that if it really were the case that allowing people to use drugs in public decreased overdoses and deaths, you'd see that reflected in the overdose data in BC uh, since they began their decriminalization experiments back about a year ago. But we haven't seen that. So I, I really questioned how the judge is coming to the conclusion that the argument made by harm reduction activists is a persuasive one. Yeah, and I, I would say going back a year is uh, one area, but BC has had for many, many years the most permissive approach to drugs anywhere in the country. We've had, I mean, the, the original fight over so-called harm reduction was uh, a center in British Columbia insight, and that's going back... I, close to 20 years now, maybe at least 15, 16 years. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got these safe supply programs that have been in effect, and, and yet BC is still uh, the worst as far as overdoses are concerned. So, I mean, the, the stated goal behind a lot of these programs just isn't panning out in the data. Well, the problem is that for, for many BC addiction policymakers, they don't seem to actually care about real research. A lot of the research in this space is very low quality or you know, has often sometimes been biased. Uh, even, for example, Insight, a lot of the research that was produced around that in 2003 to 2007 uh, was produced by individuals who had lobbied for the creation of Insight to begin with. So there was a lot of conflict of interest there and they were criticized for you know, coming to misleading conclusions. So you can look at the numbers here and you can say, well, obviously this isn't working, but these harm reduction activists don't seem to really care. Right. All they'll say is that, well, that just means that we need more harm reduction. Uh, they don't see a lack of success as anything against them. They just see it as evidence of, you know, of that we need more drugs. Yeah, and, and you did in, in your report, and impeccably researched, by the way, it's like 36 pages. Now there's, you know, credits and cover and all of that. But uh, you did this report from McDonald Laurier Institute looking specifically at uh, the Safe Supply Fentanyl Tablet uh, program here. And I, first off, why did you focus in on, on that issue? Well, I focused on the issue because I was emailed by two addiction physicians who thought the whole thing was ludicrous, right? And and so essentially, if, you know, since your listeners aren't fully familiar with this whole issue, uh, starting in August, BC uh, permitted the province-wide prescription of safe supply fentanyl tablets and Sioux fentanyl. Uh, and they, they did this really, you know, quietly. There was no press release. Uh, there's been no media on it, which is really odd because usually harm reduction advocates advertise when they expand safer supply. And so I started looking into it and I realized that the way that they were expanding safer supply fentanyl was grossly irresponsible. Uh, so the current system that we have today where we distribute hydromorphone, which is basically heroin, is already broken because we don't require supervised consumption. So people sell their safer supply drugs on the streets. So we decided to give out fentanyl. And we decided to put in no no requirement for safer like for supervised consumption. So now we're creating a system that is set up to essentially flood communities with fentanyl in addition to government heroin, which you know I personally think is irresponsible, and I think many people would agree with me. And, and I will say it's not just a, a theoretical issue that these are ending up in the illegal uh, drug trade. I mean, there have been a number of demonstrable cases in BC and, and also in Ontario where people can pretty well prove how these drugs are ending up uh, just being trafficked. Well, that's the thing is that so here, here's the thing. When it comes to scientific and formal studies of diversion, that's what they call it when this is sold to the you know, to the streets. None, none of these studies are happening because harm reduction activists aren't interested in exploring this issue. Uh, and the federal government, despite throwing $100 million in safer supply, has not funded one study that seriously looks at diversion. The only research that's being done into diversion is essentially act, asking drug users who are on safer supply, do you divert? And if so, why? So obviously that's incredibly biased. You know, hey, are you selling your drugs? If so, why are you doing it? Um, and they'll, you know, they'll whitewash it. They'll say, oh, it's just mutual aid or whatever. Um, so what I've been doing is I've been, you know, for the past year speaking to different stakeholder groups about safer supply. And I've just consistently been hearing from people that, yes, this diversion is happening. You know, I heard that from over 30 addiction physicians. 
Uh, I interviewed former drug users in London, Ontario. I interviewed online drug users on Reddit who were openly selling Safer Supply and posting photos with prescriptions validating that Safer Supply. I've spoken with over 50 youth who talk about how hydromorphin is a big issue in their schools and how their peers are getting it from Safer Supply. So it's, it's ridiculous to me that people are saying that this is not a big problem. But the thing is that our federal government and the BC government and these harm reduction activists do not care. You, you can, sh it, it's like pointing to the sky and saying the sky is blue and they say, well, how do you know that? It, it's <laughs> completely irrational. Is there, I, I think I may know the answer to this, but I, I may not. I, we, we had, I mean, when you were on the show previously, we, we had you alongside uh, two experts who have themselves been very gung-ho for harm reduction and then eventually had a bit of uh, buyer's remorse ab about that when they followed the, the data. But I'm wondering if among the people that are still advocates in general for harm reduction, if they're all the same, if they're all about this, you know, this, this sort of wasteland approach that we see in BC, or are there moderates that I guess, for lack of a better term, that are saying, well, hang on, I, I kind of agree in principle, but I can't go that far. Well, I mean, so here's the thing, there's a lot of moderate people who are in, for harm reduction. Harm reduction itself is not a bad thing. You know, it is a key pillar for addressing the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. in addition to, let's say, prevention, treatment and education. But it is a very big umbrella that includes a wide scope of intervention, some of which are better than others. Well, yeah, so, I mean, just to interject there, it yeah. used to be that harm reduction was about the needles and the pipes you use, not the giving out drugs. Yeah, look, harm reduction was championed in the late 80s and 90s, uh, primarily by HIV researchers who wanted to decrease HIV infection rates mm -hmm. because people were using dirty needles. And that was very effective. And, you know, you had needle exchange programs that demonstrably decreased rates of transmission for HIV and other bloodborne illnesses. And then these researchers ended up rebranding themselves as addiction experts in the 2000s and 2010s. And they started, you know, implementing more questionable interventions. Uh, many of the people I've spoken to, they are almost all of them accept the need for harm reduction in some capacity. And even some of them accept the need for safe supply in some capacity where it's much, much, much more tightly controlled than what we see today. Um, so there's this wide gradient of approaches to harm reduction, but BC has taken the most extreme and most irresponsible one and then vilified anyone who opposes it as being, I don't know, some kind of backwards troglodyte, despite the fact that most of these people support harm reduction in some capacity. What are their benchmarks for success? I mean, because again, even no matter how cynical I get, I, there must be some target that they're pointing to as evidence that it's working. What is that? Oh, okay. So there's three different kinds of studies that support safer supply, all of which are deeply flawed. So the first one is where they just interview drug users on safer supply. And when the drug users say, oh, this is great, it makes me happier, I'm overdosing less, they say, oh, that's objective evidence that this works. Uh, it's basically, it's a customer testimonial. Uh, so that's not valid at all. The second level is doing uh, quantitative studies, but the underlying data is still self-reported. So essentially they hand out a whole bunch of surveys, say, you know, right from the scale of one to 10, uh, how you feel about X or has this happened to you in the past? Have you overdosed? Yada, yada, yada. Um, and so you can crunch those numbers. So there's le they're less open to misinterpretation than let's say, you know, an interview. But ultimately, self-reported data, you know, the drug users know what kind of results they need, you know, to get to continue having access to their drugs. So it's, it's also not trustworthy. The, the third level, and this is the one that's more complicated for people to wrap their heads around. So there's a recent study that came out last year in Ontario that used Ontario's administrative health data to show that safer supply programs did have positive impacts on their clients. But there's a huge caveat here. So safer supply programs don't just give you free drugs, they also give you access to significant wraparound supports like social housing, mm. uh, primary care, uh, sorry, blanked out, there's a few other ones on top of that. Uh, but the, the study made no attempt to discern whether positive impacts came from the wraparound supports or the free mm. drugs. So uh, I'll just finish this monologue. Uh, the comparison would be like, Imagine a really obese man and you, you put him on a diet plan and you give him access to a personal trainer and you give him access to a life coach and a psychologist. And then you give him a free piece of cake once a week <laughs> and he loses weight. And you say, well, obviously giving cake is what caused him to lose weight. Well, no, 
So that's what this kind of study is like. Yeah. Yeah, there goes my there goes my uh, New Year's strategy for weight loss. There, a cake uh, cake a week keeps the pounds off. Well, no, that, that's quite fascinating. And and you know the one thing I will also point out is that I don't hear in the rhetoric a lot of discussion about trying to get people off drugs as even being a, a goal. I mean, there's a fair bit of resignation that I think underlies a lot of these programs, which is well they're using them, so we just have to try to get the best outcomes within that. Well, that's the thing is that many people think that safer supply is this compassionate response. It, it's not compassionate. We're giving up on people. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're basically giving them palliative care, right? We're keeping them comfortable until they die uh, or until we can give them maid. <laughs> um, and then how is that compassionate? And look, theoretically, theoretically, safer supply is meant to keep people alive until they seek treatments. But in practice, safer supply programs rarely push people towards recovery. I mean, it exists in the guidelines as a theoretical thing, but people just take their drugs and they sell it and then they buy fentanyl until they die. And that's just horrific. I, I know that your work on, on this in the past has, has been shared uh, notably by, by Pierre Polyev, the conservative leader who's taken an interest in this. And I, I'm wondering though, if there were a change in the federal government, how much of, of what's happening in BC could even change and how versus how much of it is squarely within the provincial jurisdiction? I'm actually not entirely sure about the distinction between the federal and provincial jurisdiction here. It's so, murky. I, that's the best I've been able to unearth myself on this. Well, here's the thing. So uh, Safer Supply is provided in two main ways. So way one is through federally funded programs. Um, and these can be forced into provinces. Uh, there are provinces that have resisted Safer Supply. And the federal government is still funded programs operating within them. Um, though I think Alberta has effectively banned Safer Supply regardless of the federal government's intentions. Um, and then on the second level, the provincial government can incentivize people to uptake safer supply, or they can, for example, create uh, protocols that allow regular prescribers to prescribe safer supply. So you just, you know, your regular doctor, it's outside of a specialized mm -hmm. program. If the federal government changes, you know, all the fucking, sorry, all the funding uh, <laughs> for, uh, for safer Here goes supply. our clean tag on iTunes. <laughs> yeah. It's been a good run. Uh, all, all the funding, federal funding for safer supply will go away and all of these projects which create really terrible research will be take, you know, they'll be offline, which will be great. Um, and what I would love to see is a federally funded investigation into safer supply and federally funded studies into the harms of safer supply. And I think it'll be politically difficult for provinces to defend safer supply once they lose federal support, uh, because what that'll mean is that addiction physicians will start speaking out more. Many of them are worried about mm -hmm. losing access to federal grants. Uh, it means that as more knowledge comes out, more people are gonna sue provincial governments. I know that there are people who are looking into lawsuits right now. Um, and number three, just, you know, once you have more kids and, and drug users and more evidence coming out, this is a disaster. You know, no one wants to lose their, their government. I know that the BC NDP is very worried about a conservative resurgence. So I think that if Safer Supply starts imploding, they would definitely abandon ship. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. And even just on the, the playground topic that we started, I mean, that's an issue where parents that otherwise don't care about this are, are going to all of a sudden become very concerned when they can't even take their kids to the playground. And already I hear from people emailing and saying, oh, my son or daughter is uh, in university in Toronto and is scared to take the subway. Like th these are, this has just become a fact of life now in, in Canada. And that is, is not sustainable. Uh, Adam Zevo, great uh, report for the McDonald Laurier Institute on this and also great work in the National Post always. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Always a pleasure to chat with Adam. Uh, no one asked me, no one asked me to commission reports for, uh, for anyone. It's everyone else that I have on the show. They're all these like great journalists that are, are getting asked to do these like big 40 page academic reports. I just, uh, well, I, I have a book, so I can't complain too, too much, but anyway, uh, by the way, I finished it. I was uh, working on it for the last six months. I submitted my second book and hopefully not my last to my publisher on uh, Tuesday of this week at like 7 30 PM. So I finally get to have a life again. Hopefully I'll be able to share with you in the coming days, if not weeks, a little bit more about that. Uh, some, pe some people know, I, 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 some, someone emailed me and they had somehow figured out what I was working on. Maybe someone I had interviewed for the book tipped them off, but uh, nevertheless, that is coming out 
in just uh, hopefully hopefully in May, I believe it will be coming out. But the details should be coming out before then. So uh, we are going to have lots more about that in the future. But I wanted to pivot to another issue here. And this is one not connected to any news of the day, not connected to politics, but as well, I shouldn't say not connected to politics, not directly connected to politics and political news. But I think it underlies a lot of the problems we see in our political system. Uh, one of the biggest trends of the last uh, 20 years, I'd say, has been the pl proliferation of cancel culture. We have this great political divide where people on the left and right no longer wish to talk to each other. We have a, a fair bit of nastiness about that, not just in the House of Commons when politicians are lobbing their rhetorical grenades across the aisle at each other, but in civil society. We have people that are getting torn apart in their family dinners because they are unable to discuss things in a civil manner. But what is civility? This is a topic that I, again, I've heard a lot of people call for civility, but I've never heard that underlying discussion uh, from a philosophical and spiritual and cultural perspective of what it is and why it's so important until I read a book that came out in the fall called The Soul of Civility, written by Alexandra Hudson, who I am very pleased to have joining me right now. Alexandra, good to talk to you. Thanks very much for coming on. Andrew, thanks for having me. Thrilled to be here. So why, I, I kind of gave a political lead into this. This is not a, a political book, but I certainly think it's applicable to the political climate in, in a lot of ways. Why did you decide to delve into civility first and foremost? I came to my interest in this topic, honestly. My mother is called the manners lady. So I was raised in this home that was very attentive to social norms and social expectations. I am constitutionally allergic to authority, Andrew. That might not surprise me. <laughs> I hate rules. I hate being told what to do. And so I remember always questioning these rules and expectations. My mother uh, always, uh, you know, and asked my brothers and I to comply with, you know, why do we do things the way we do them? And is the way that we're asked to do them, is that the best way? Is it just because some self-appointed authority at some point in history said we should do it? And I, I just like hungered for a why behind our norms and expectations. But my mother said that they would lead to success in work, school, life. And uh, if I followed them and, and she was generally right until I found myself in federal government. I actually served in uh, the prime minister's office in Canada and uh, in Washington, DC in a presidential administration there as well. And I saw and experienced this um, uh, kind of a challenge to, to this conventional wisdom my mother had raised me with in both environments. I saw these two extremes. On one hand, I saw people who were um, hostile. They had sharp elbows. They, they, um, they, there were no secrets about, you know, that they were willing to dispense with anyone, step on anyone to get ahead. On the other hand, I saw people who at first, I thought they were my people. They were polished and poised and polite, yet ruthless and cruel. And this second contingent really threw me because at first, um, you know, they, they, they disarmed me. I thought they were my friends. But one thing my mother had said to me growing up was that manners mattered because they were an outward expression of our inward character. And yet here I was surrounded by people who are well-mannered but ruthless and cruel. So part of the argument is that there's this essential distinction between civility and politeness, that civility is more than just manners. Because as I learned, you could smile and, and be polished and well-poised but not be respectful of others. So a part of the argument of the book is disambiguating, disentangling these ideas, arguing we need actually less politeness, less the faux respect, the tone policing, the worrying about saying and doing the right thing, and more actual respect, more, more the disposition of, of actually respecting others that sometimes requires telling a hard truth, offending people, mm -hmm. engaging in robust debate. Yeah, and I found that, that politeness, civility uh, contrast to be a fascinating one because we see it. I, I'm glad you used the word tone policing because we see how civility or appeals to civility are used as, as a tool to quell dissent, mm -hmm. uh, to quell uh, challenging certain ideas, behaviors, whatnot. And I, I think young women are, are probably uh, mm -hmm. particularly susceptible to this, young women and girls, where you're, you're told to, to be civil, but the, the issue is not actually one of civility. 
No, you're exactly right. So I was I was raised in Canada. I, I grew up in Canada and I am a strong woman and I'm from a family of strong women. And that often rub people the wrong way. Canada prides itself on being this polite society. I mean, I have friends that, um, you know, wear Canadian pins when they travel abroad because they ca Canadians are beloved. We're so nice, you know, but there is such thing as too much of a good thing, you know, that that <laughs> that actually being niceness, being nice is not all it's cracked up to be. Like there were times where I was told, uh, like people didn't, you know, male figures in my life didn't know what to do with me because I spoke my mind and, and that like I didn't fit their mold, their norm of what and how a woman mm. should Canadian woman should should behave, and actually, so it, it's possible to to that that to to you know value um, you know tone, and as you as you mentioned, um, that these norms can be a tool of of silencing of of repressing, and that actually, if we want a, a society of of openness of tolerance of pluralism, it's actually essential that we make these these norms of propriety matter less uh, in order to have open honest discussion and and to have an open an open society. How universal is this idea in your research of, of civility and how much does this change from a North American context to a European context to, say, an Asian context? It's a great question. So what I found in my research, and I did approach this question from a global perspective, a, a universal perspective, mm -hmm. um, and and what I what I discovered is that that the the norms of politeness, the manners, the etiquette, the technique, the external stuff of manners and etiquette, they tend to be very changeable across history and across culture, and even within a culture between classes. Often manners uh, have been used, and they are still used as a way to define in group, out group. You know, keep keep the nouveau riche, the outsider outside. It's a way to dis distinguish who, you know, we're okay as long as we're doing and doing and saying the right things. And this is actually an all too human tendency uh, for, that we see across history and across culture. Whereas the timeless principles of civility, restraint of the ego so that the social can flourish, that we can become fully human in friendship and relationship with others, that is those norms are remarkably timeless. And in fact, I opened my book with uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest story in the world in my chapter one, and then moved to the oldest book in the world, which is a, a manners book, a civility handbook from ancient Egypt giving to, given to us 2400 BC. And so I really try to do uh, justice to the subject matter. This is my book is about the most important question of our day. How do we flourish across difference, even we deeply disagree. But as I learned, even though it's the most important question now, it's also the defining question of democracy, of the classical liberal project, also the defining question of our species. We've been trying to do this thing called life together across difference as long as we've been around. And I bring to bear the wisdom of the human tradition to help us do life better together now. What, what, just thinking of Asia for a moment, I think it's Japan where I, I learned of this. I, I've never been, but a, a friend of mine, uh, his wife is from Japan and he's been there many times. And he had said that there was a, a culture there where it's considered rude to not have the answer if someone asks. So if you say ask for directions uh, in some context and someone doesn't know, they'll give you the wrong directions because they think that's the polite thing. But that's mm -hmm. not actually helping you in any way. They're just pointing you down some random street. So you are right about how manners and civility I mean, and, and that that's an extreme example of your being done a disservice right. in the interest of being polite and respectful. And I, I think that's one of the areas where I would say is the core distinction and that manners is how you behave. Civility mm -hmm. requires a respect of other people mm -hmm. that manners doesn't. I mean, being well mannered in, in any context is just something you do. So can you have civility without respect? And how do you get to the point where there is respect, which also seems to be in, in short supply, certainly in politics, but I'd say in society in general. It's a great question about the relationship between civility and politeness. You know, can you have one without the other? And I think at its ideal, the disposition of civility, the inner orientation that honestly respects others, the dignity and irreducible value of others, out of that disposition will flow kind actions, you know, polite actions that are that are actually other oriented, but they come, they are an outgrowth of that earnest respect and esteem uh, for, for the other. But the problem is when as a society, we value just the external, just the what we do and say, and we insufficiently uh, seek to cultivate that inner disposition of really respecting others, really respecting um, the gift of being human, 
That's a problem. It, it, it sets us up for hypocrisy. It sets us up for you know disingenuousness. Um, and so, as a, as, a, as a society in the West, as, as Canadians, it's, it's essential that we you know care less about the norms that make us seem good and instead shift our focus to what actually makes us good and what is actually truly respectful of others. One of the things, if we were to take a, a more forward-looking view on on this, that a lot of people will struggle with is the how do we get there? Because mm -hmm. uh, civil people engaging in a civil discussion like you and I are, and I hope our audiences can say, oh yeah, this is great. This is a good thing. But that doesn't deal with the shortage of it. So, I mean, you talked about your experience in politics and government, where you have people that are uh, very ruthless, maybe they're ambitious, maybe they're sociopaths, whatever it is, but clearly they don't have or tap into in themselves what it is that they need to be more civil. So how do we as a society deal with this without just pointing the fingers and saying, well, I'm not the problem, he is or she is? No, it is the most human and natural thing in the world to want to blame. You know, our public leaders, the other side. Um, and, and my book is all about the power that we each have to be a part of the solution, that that we can't blame media. We can't blame, you know, who's prime minister, who's president, what's going on around the world that we, we can all we can control is ourselves. And we vastly underestimate the power we each have to be part of the solution. So I call myself a refugee from federal government. So <laughs> I, when I was in Washington, D.C., I fled. I came home from work one day and said to my husband, I am done with government. I'm done with D.C., done with politics let's move to Indiana. And my husband's from the Midwest, from Indiana originally, so he was thrilled to hear this. He said, he said okay, sounds good, let's do it, no take backs. And that was almost six years ago. We've been, we've been in Indiana since then. And um, one of my first friends here, her name was Joanna Taft, and she came up to me after church one day and said, hi, I'm Joanna, would you like to porch with us sometime? And I never heard- I, I didn't know that was a verb, by the way. That's right. I'd never heard. I didn't either. I'd never heard that before, but we were curious to know many people. We went to her home one afternoon and I realized that she was staging this quiet revolution against our atomized and divided status quo from her front porch that she had curated people across class, race, ethnicity, politics, just to inhabit a shared space, not to, you know, have a curated conversation across difference, but to build trust and friendship that is so lacking today in our public life. And is in fact, one reason why we're not able to have conversations across difference well at all, if we don't have that basic respect, trust, affection for our fellow citizens, our fellow human beings. And I actually had the privilege of studying and, and researching and visiting people like Joanna across North America, who are doing the exact same thing. They're saying, I can't control what's happening in my nation's capital or around the world, but I can control myself. And I'm going to double down and make my community better, my family stronger. And there's tremendous power in that. I met people who were doing that with and without a porch, from their local coffee shop, from their you know hosting supper clubs, dinner parties, from uh, using a front stoop or front lawn that is not about you know big city, small town. It's just about a way of engaging others in the world with civility, with hospitality, which is a high and noble expression of civility and wanting to transform the outsider to the inside, the stranger into the friend. And this is something that is too important and too sophisticated and complex to be left to our public leaders to be, and it can't be scaled either. It's only something that can be individual, micro, um, at the at the one-on-one -on -one level. And it's a decision we have to make every moment of every day. Are we going to make the world a better and brighter place for, for future generations to live in? I mean, that's why I wrote this book for my children. Or are we going to be part of the problem? By it, in, in how we live our lives. And I hope that readers come away encouraged that, that, that we, again, we have far more power to be part of the solution of restoring the soul of civility in our world today than we, than we realize. Well, and you even got the title in there. The uh, We'll put the cover up to augment that in people's minds. It is called The Soul of Civility by Alexander Hudson. People can uh, catch it on Amazon or elsewhere. And you've actually had uh, quite a bit of uh, critical acclaim for this uh, now that's been out a few months, which is uh, quite good. So congratulations on Thanks. that, Alexandra. Thank you so much for coming on. Such a pleasure, Andrew. Thank you for having me. All right. All the best to you and uh, to all of you tuning in. That does it for us for today. We will be back on Monday with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show. Uh, irreverence and civility. We might need to do another episode to explore whether those can coexist. Although I got an email saying I'm being insufficiently irreverent as of late. So I'll try to boost up the irreverence when we return on Monday. But uh, always good to talk to you folks. Have a good weekend. Thank you. God bless and good day to you all. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.